Interlinked. What's it like to hold the hand of someone you love? Interlinked. Interlinked. Do they teach you how to feel finger to finger? Interlinked. Interlinked. Do you long for having your heart interlinked? Interlinked. Interlinked. Do you dream about being interlinked? Interlinked. What's it like to hold your child in your arms? Interlinked. Interlinked. Do you feel that there's a part of you that's missing? Interlinked. Interlinked. Within cells interlinked. Within cells interlinked. Why don't you say that three times? Within cells interlinked. Within cells interlinked. Within cells In the year 2049, the protagonist K is the new model replicant. He is someone who obeys at all costs, being completely unconscious of any possibility of freedom. We soon see him flying to retire an older replicant, being both literally and figuratively on autopilot. And just as he is able to detach himself from the act of killing by considering it a retirement, he is also detached from all controls and decisions in his life. He is a passive observer, becoming engaged in his life only when absolutely necessary. Kay soon confronts Sapper Morton, the antiquated replicant who tells Kay that he doesn't question his commands because he's never seen a miracle. Kay mindlessly obeys orders because nothing has ever made an impression on him. He has never been made to question his automatic thinking, to evaluate his place in the world and what it means. He is dead to the universe, operating on unconscious drives and asleep to the possibilities of a different life. He soon retires Morton and picks up a flower to smell it. There may be some yearning deep within Kay, but it is buried beneath his many layers of programming. The world Kay lives in has become a land of endless civilization. People living upon people living upon people. An infinite grid of buildings, metal, and lights. A labyrinth of humanity in which one is easily lost and forgotten, with no way to rise above. He returns to the police station and performs a psychological test to ensure his baseline functioning, with that baseline being one of absence of emotion and passion. A poetic and metaphorical series of phrases and words must be recited repeatedly, designed in a way so that the once beautiful and inspiring statements lose all of their power and meaning. Several questions are posed about feelings and moments of potential relevance but these are also mangled by interspersing the word interlinked within, effectively turning it all into rubbish and insignificance, while at the same time implying that replicants have no choice to be independent, being forever tied to their masters. When he passes, he is called Constant K and provided monetary reward for his compliance with the rules. K returns to his retreat among the chaos and we see the life of the everyday man. It is one of predictability and rote routine. Cooking stale pasta, talking about trivialities of his day, and saying he needs a drink right away. He is the stereotype of a man who doesn't want to try and likes everything to be decided for him. No originality and no creativity needed. Everything is as clear and straightforward as day since a purely pedestrian life is all that is required. Even his virtual wife, Joy, is able to conform to whatever the day calls for. She can adjust to his mood and meet his second-to-second -second preference. There is no risk of conflict, as problems are often averted before they have a chance to bubble to the surface. When the police learn of a child born from a replicant, Kay's boss is ready to wipe out all information and eliminate the child. But Kay shows his first glimpse of defiance by questioning this plan, stating that things which are born are said to have souls, and that he normally doesn't kill things which possess a soul. As he is about to leave the office, the lieutenant tells him he is getting along fine without a soul of his own. But based on his facial expression and his thoughts about his encounter with Morton, he may not be in agreement. It seems as if he is realizing there is something terribly wrong with the way he is living, about the patterns he has been caught in for so long. But if he is questioning these decisions, what does that mean about his lack of a soul? Could he possess a deeper ethical wiring that is beginning to expose itself in faint glimmers? As Kay continues his investigation, he is startled by the engraving on the wooden horse causing a past memory to arise. 
It brings him back to a time in which he was helpless and fragile, a mere weakling who was at the whim of the world around him, the other boys looking to steal his horse, using power and coercion to try and break him. It makes us think about his passive existence and the ways this form of living serves as a good defense against a cruel and unforgiving world. Why try if it will all lead to misery and heartache? Joy wants him to look further into his past, believing he may have been the one who was born naturally. But this coincidence is dangerous to Kay, in that it means going outside the bounds of his formulaic programming, running the risk of defying his code of servitude and instead leading to the possibility of aliveness and excitement. For Kay, aliveness equals danger, and so he focuses only on negative outcomes of the tyranny that chased him in his dreams, continually being stifled by the past and the power it holds over him in the present day. As his pursuit of the truth continues, Kay eventually locates the furnace from his memory and the same feeling of fear returns. He becomes stuck in the emotion, unable to break out, exposing us to a very different man than what we saw in the first part of the film. This man is one with a story behind himself, some type of context. He has a life which is graspable and which matters. He is no longer nothing. He is something of substance. The unconscious fear has been there all along, but now it is being faced and understood instead of being stuffed away. Pieces are being put together, leading to the release of long suppressed emotions. Kay soon meets Dr. Anna and he asks her, how can you tell if something really happened? She replies, we recall with our feelings, anything real should be a mess. And with that, we are provided a key element that allows him to connect to the inner being of his soul. His remembering and its link to feelings is the basis for his current journey. It is providing the meaning which has always been missing. He then says, I know it's real, and explodes with anger. Living a life of passivity and detachment was the easy route because there was no stakes involved, nothing was at risk. At the same time, he was unaware of why he was doing what he was doing, being driven by unconscious factors. But now that he is connected to the memory and the emotion, it is inevitable that he face the person that he is and become active in the process. He can no longer listen to the commands of others. Instead, he can only listen to the commands of his personal inner controller. A fate that many will avoid to remain in ignorant comfort. He returns to the office to perform the psych test, and he cannot return to baseline. His logical and robot-like nature has been compromised. He answers the questions with hesitation, with thought and feeling involved now. He is being distanced from his unconsciously driven nature due to emerging realities. As once foggy fragments come to the surface, he can no longer hold the tension, unable to be the automaton he was for so long. After Kay is captured and is speaking with the leaders of the revolution, he learns that he was not the child who was born, leading to a sort of existential crisis and posing a very important question to himself. If life isn't just about him, what makes him continue to fight? Why should he be the hero if he himself is not the special individual he believed himself to be? He wants to be the one favored by God, something which is no longer possible. Soon after, when Kay fights love to save Deckard, it seems that love has the upper hand and she claims that she is the best one. It's as if all the slaves and perhaps all the human beings in the story desire to be special in some way to be recognized and to be placed apart. But being special means being better than others, resulting in the need to crush and dominate. Kay soon kills love and proves that he is in fact the better one, but not because he bested her and outwitted her. He is better because he faced down his fears and the past that was controlling him. Instead of being ignorant of his drives and resisting the urge to discover, he made the choice to no longer be at the whim of fate and to instead create his own destiny. And through facing his own fears, it's as if he simultaneously began to realize his shared humanity with others, 
one in which most are being ruled by external and internal tyrannies. He has understood that releasing himself and others from these prisons of fear is what truly designates one as special and favored. Neither K or anyone else is going to be special because they are chosen by God, because they are singled out above others. One only becomes special by sharing in the struggles common to mankind and using individual experience to help guide others towards liberation from suffering. He rejects the need to be separate from others and instead chooses to fuse with them, sacrificing his own need to be the one, attempting instead to be part of the greater whole. K proceeds to reconnect Deckard with his daughter and reeling from his battle wound, lies down on the steps of the building and enjoys the snow falling on his face. A truly noble act followed by one of sheer simplicity. He seems to be connecting to the meaning of his life just as it's coming to an end. In his very last moments, he relishes in what truly makes one a human being by being in complete harmony with himself and his surroundings, perhaps showing that he has had a soul all along. This has been the psychology of Blade Runner 2049. Please watch my other videos on other TV and film characters if you enjoyed this video. Thank you for watching.